so yeah, I'm so, um, pretty happy to be here to start talking uh, to you about why you should consider running JavaScript inside WebAssembly. So my name is Angel. I'm uh, I'm a staff engineer in the WebAssembly team inside the VMware AI Labs. Um, today I'm here with Saul Cabrera. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it to come to the conference. So instead of having uh, him directly make it load, I will have virtual Saul with us. So he will help me with with all the presentation. Saul is a staff engineer working at Shopify team. He's especially working on the Shopify Functions project in which they allow you to extend um, their Shopify platform with custom code. He will talk a bit more about, about this. But before starting with, uh, with the specific use cases, let's, let's talk a little bit about JavaScript and WebAssembly. So before actually starting with that, I would like to, to do a quick uh, survey. So who of you, raise your hand please, are familiar with, with WebAssembly? Okay, that's cool. And um, how many of you actually use it in the past? Okay, that's cool. that's cool. yeah. So so good. So basically, WebAssembly is a open standard that defines that defines a binary structure format for a virtual machine. What it means, all these words in reality is that you have different application, different programming languages like C, Go, Rust, C, among others that you can actually compile, but instead of compiling it to a specific architecture and operating system like Linux AMD64, you compile it to WebAssembly. So you get a specific binary that can run anywhere that you provide a WebAssembly runtime or WebAssembly virtual machine. This sounds, may sound weird because, I mean, I also came from the JavaScript world, from the full stack, and I think uh, I used to work with dynamic languages and interpreted languages, so I didn't know anything about compilation, more than using Webpack um, and different kind of bundlers. But this is how, in other cases, when we want to run native binaries, for example, in Windows, Linux, we actually need to compile the code and then run them directly. The thing is that when I say it runs anywhere when we have our assembly runtimes, this includes browsers which is very familiar to us. We have different kind of uh, browsers that support or include our WebAssembly runtime, like Chrome and V8, uh, Mozilla, Firefox, and SpiderMonkey, and all of those allows you to run these kind of applications. And how you actually access to those applications, how you start the WebAssembly modules, using JavaScript, which is the actual blue code that allows you to load the WebAssembly module, load it in the browser, and start running it. Based on this specific architecture, this happened like years ago when they started implementing WebAssembly and it helped developers to uh, develop applications like Figma, for example, which, was, which started as one of the main applications using uh, WebAssembly intensively. And they also helped to port existing applications to the browser. So we have today Adobe Photoshop in the browser, we have Google Earth, and instead of having to create everything from scratch in JavaScript, they could take their old code bases, compile them to WebAssembly, if they're doing slight changes, and then running it directly in the browser. So WebAssembly opens the possibilities to run uh, this kind of code, like C, C++ code, in the browser without having to deal with transcompilation steps and things like that. So this is the current, the current structure that we have, which is basically we have a browser that runs JavaScript, that loads your WebAssembly, Runtime, uh, sorry, the WebAssembly module, runs application, gets everything. And what I'm talking to you here is to actually run JavaScript inside that specific WebAssembly module, which could be something like in which level of inception we are, like running it stuff inside of stuff, can we even go a step further? But the key part or the key thing of this specific talk is that this is just one example of where you can run WebAssembly, but not everything is inside the browser. You can actually run WebAssembly in many different environments. Like, for example, in a data center or in a cloud, running a negative server, you can do it inside a mobile phone directly in your application, like using an Android or an iOS. You can run it in an embedded device or in IoT devices. So just to get you an idea about why JavaScript may start making sense to run it inside WebAssembly. 
And why? Why is so important? This is something that I have been noticing in many different projects that, be, that uses WebAssembly as a foundational technology. And is that a lot of them wants to support JavaScript inside. Why? Because everyone, well, not everyone at all, but many, many people knows about JavaScript. So from very new developers to very experienced ones. So anytime your project supports WebAssembly, you have already a huge community of developers that understand how to use your project. So this is where the real value of running JavaScript inside WebAssembly start making shape and start making sense. We can consider that JavaScript is a universal language. This is a famous quote from Jeff Atwood about that any application that can run in, Web in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. So we have the use cases about the browsers, which is pretty, pretty cool for WebAssembly and where it actually started, but it opens a new set of possibilities for, for running JavaScript in many other environments that before wasn't supposed to. And here is where we are going to talk specifically about the use case of Shopify and why they use WebAssembly and JavaScript to extend their own, uh, their own platform. And for this, it's the tool for Saul. Hi, thanks for having me. So in this section, we're going to talk about extending Shopify with WebAssembly. And in the next section, we're going to talk about how JavaScript on WebAssembly works. In order to understand a bit more why we have adopted WebAssembly at Shopify, it's important to take a look at our use case. And our use case is extensibility. We can think of extensibility as opening one part of your system to execute on trusted third-party code. In order to understand a bit more how extensibility works in the context of Shopify, let's take a look at the personas involved in this process. So at the center of everything, we have Shopify, Shopify's infrastructure. And the first persona is the buyer. The buyer is someone that is looking to buy physical or digital goods online. The second persona is the merchant. The merchant is the persona who's responsible for selling this physical or digital goods online. Then the third persona is the third party developer, whose responsibility is to extend Shopify through an app that doesn't have to run Shopify's infrastructure or through a function, what we call Shopify functions, which is the main driver for extensibility of Shopify. This whole idea of extensibility means enabling more complex interactions in the relationship between the buyer and the merchant. Shopify has all the information to enable these complex interactions, but it wouldn't be scalable if Shopify had to deal with all the combinations of how these um, interactions could go around. And by complex interactions, I mean, for example, calculating a discount. Or, you know, there are some discounts that are very simple, but there are ones that can get very complex. For example, giving you a discount for your exporter on a particular store, or giving you a discount because your particular user on that store has a particular tag. As I said before, Shopify has all the information to calculate this, but it's easier, more scalable, and definitely more um, friendly to the merchant to let them upload a script or a function that is going to allow them to write this business logic on their own because it's easier to change and it's easier to scale through time. It's important to note that these interactions must be calculated uh, in a synchronous and a secure way. Synchronous because most of the time um, these extensibility mechanisms run inline in a checkout. Why inline? Because, for example, at discount, we cannot afford to calculate a discount once the checkout has, has gone through. So it's important to make sure that we can uh, make this extensibility extensions uh, in a synchronous and in a fast way. And secure because we're dealing with third-party code. And by the nature of third-party code, it's really unsafe all the time. And here is where WebAssembly comes into play. When we first adopted WebAssembly, only system level toolchains were targeting it, like for example C or C++ or Rust. And this tool is great, but the challenge that comes with these toolchains, um, only these toolchains supporting WebAssembly, is that there's a question of adoption. What happens with all the other toolchains like JavaScript, Ruby, Python, which are more app friendly? Um, for a platform that is betting on WebAssembly, these questions inevitably come around and we have to answer them. 
And so here is where JavaScript on WebAssembly came to be a topic that we eventually invested on. So before dig digging into how we made JavaScript on WebAssembly work, I'm going to give a brief, a brief walkthrough on how JavaScript on WebAssembly, oh, sorry, on how JavaScript engines work overall without it, without them being embedded on WebAssembly. So this JavaScript engine will have a runtime environment that contain a GC, that contain other built-in functions, um, and that contain most of the API that is exposed to the other parts that we are used to working with. Then in the compilation side of things, um, these engines have a multi-tier um, compilation pipelines. And the first step in the compilation pipeline is interpreting. So the interpreter is going to grab the source code and then start interpreting it. Once it has enough information to improve um, the execution, it's going to enter in the first baseline uh, just-in-time compiler, which is going to output machine code. Not as optimized, but it's, even, it's already faster than what the interpreter can do. And the next step is an optimizing chip, which is going to grab um, that bytecode that was uh, fed into the interpreter and optimize it even further than the baseline just in time compiler. Meaning that the code that is being outputted here is going to be way, way more optimized than the baseline G tier one. And so here, this is how the full picture ends up and so working. So we have the source, then we have the compilation tier, then it gets to machine code, and then that machine code interacts in some form or another with the runtime environment. Now, when we translate this to WebAssembly, there are a couple of things that we cannot do uh, because th these are not limitations. These are features of WebAssembly, if we want to call it somehow. And the main feature here is that we cannot generate um, code at runtime. So what JIT do is that they, at runtime, uh, when your program is executing, they generate new code that gets swapped in and then that code gets executed. By default, we cannot do this on WebAssembly due to security purposes. So if you want to do any of this dynamic languages in WebAssembly, everything has to do, everything has to be ahead of time. And so the best that we can do here, for example, is grab the interpreter, grab the runtime, and then compile that to WebAssembly. So this is what we would have, for example. We would have a source uh, in which we would interpret, and the interpreter obviously has access to the runtime environment, so the best that we can do here is interpretation. And you may think, well, this is going to be slow. Yes, it's going to be slow if you compare it to native execution, although there are some techniques that are starting to surface right now that might enable us to do full out-of-time compilation of JavaScript, um, taking advantage of its basic tiers. And so what I want to depict with this here is that um, when we have a WebAssembly module of a JavaScript engine compiled to WebAssembly with a particular program, we have the runtime environment and we have the interpreter. So the runtime environment is what I already explained, and the interpreter is the dynamic piece that is going to interpret whatever code um, <coughs> you give them. So one thing to note here is that the runtime environment is going to be static. Nothing changes there because it's only giving the interpreter access to um, JavaScript APIs, for example, or garbage collection, if that's something that you have enabled, but usually when running JavaScript in WebAssembly, we disable any garbage collection because the module is going to get dropped at the end of an execution, basically collecting it, all the memory that has been allocated in that particular module. But the important thing here is that this runtime environment is constant, so we can do some ahead of time optimization with it, which is what we're going to see next. So we have this WebAssembly module that contains a particular execution piece, which is the interpreter, it's a dynamic piece of the particular module, and then we can generate a snapshot ahead of time that's going to generate a new WebAssembly module in which the constant part has been fully optimized ahead of time, so that when this WebAssembly module gets executed at runtime, we don't have to initialize the engine over and over, meaning that we don't have to pay that price of doing that constant work and your module gets um, uploaded to, to whatever infrastructure you're running into. Um, so in this model, this specific execution is going to be faster than if we had to execute the engine 
initialization all the time, the constant part every time. In fact, there is a very good article um, in the Bike Alliance blog uh, called Making JavaScript Run Fast in WebAssembly where it explains how it explains all the technicalities uh, of how this is done through this tool called Wiser, which is a Bike Alliance project. Um, and you can read it there. Uh, at the end, we're going to have some QR codes with all the links that we have um, in this presentation, if you're curious. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Saul, for everything that, that he mentioned. This is the kind of internals about how this works, that in reality, when we talk about running JavaScript in WebAssembly, it means that you actually need to compile a specific JavaScript runtime in the WebAssembly model, and then it will run the code on top of it. For this specific thing, compilation of a JavaScript runtime is not something that is trivial, and that people that are used to work with JavaScript is not an easy thing, actually. You need to understand how to compile C code. In this case, we are using WikiJS, which is a pretty small JavaScript uh, runtime. So for simplifying all these steps and just getting your code running, on top of a JavaScript uh, runtime, we have the concept of Javi. So Javi is a project created by Shopify, but now it's part of another uh, organization which is called uh, Bytecode Alliance, that allows you to convert JavaScript source code directly into a WebAssembly model that will include not only your source code, but the actual JavaScript runtime compiled uh, internally. It's super easy to use, it's a super nice user experience, and this is kind of the first iteration that Shopify did to simplify how developers can extend their new, uh, um, their new service called Shopify Functions using uh, JavaScript on top of WebAssembly. So for this, we have a demo. Now, I'm going to show you how Javi, our JavaScript to WebAssembly toolchain, works. Here I have a very simple index.javascript file, which, if it works as expected, once we execute this, it should print hello world to the console. Before compiling any of this to WebAssembly, I'm going to give you a brief walkthrough on how Wiser uh, works inside Javi. Here we have a raw straight that is going to um, that is exporting a wiser dot initialize function. So when this raw straight get com gets compiled to WebAssembly, we're going to get a WebAssembly module that is going to export this wiser dot initialize function. And this um, initialize function, what we're doing is initializing the runtime, which is QuickJS. That's the runtime that Java uses internally, and evaluating. Um, the JavaScript source code and converting that into bytecode. And then we have a main function that is the function that, that's actually going to get executed once this module gets to run. So once we run this module, we won't repeat the wise initialize step. It actually will get removed. And then once we hit um, run or we execute this in Poisson time, the only pieces that are going to be executed are the parts on the main function. If you can see in the main function, um, we already have the bytecode ready and the runtime already initialized. So the only thing that's left to do is actually call run bytecode, which is going to interpret all the bytecode that we have already pre-processed. And by pre-processing, meaning we have already parsed the source and we have already converted that into bytecode and our engine is already initialized. So all that, we save all that processing. Um, by doing it ahead of time. Going back to our small script, if I open a terminal and I run Javi compile and pass it in the index.javascript file and then uh, instruct it to create an index of Wasm, uh, this is going to take a small while and then it's going to give us um, an index.wasm file. Now we can run this to wasm time and instruct it to run the start function um, because all Javi modules are wasm compatible. The start function is what, what gets exposed when uh, you're creating um, an executable for wasm. Once we do that, we should see hello world. So 
based on this demo, this is the final user experience that the Shopify teams wanted to give their developers. That they just need to write the JavaScript code that they want, then combine it to WebAssembly using Javi, and that's all. You don't need to take care about any compilation step for the runtime. All the thing that you saw in Rust, in Rust is the Javi code, but as a developer, you don't need to check it anymore. You just download the binary that will create the WASM file, and this is the actual function that you upload to the Shopify, um, to the Shopify infrastructure. The second project that I wanted to demo today is called WASM Worker Server, and it's, uh, it, it allows you to develop serverless applications and run it uh, basically anywhere. It can run in many different environments thanks to this portability from WebAssembly. The thing about this project and why we wanted to highlight here is that the same approach that we are having with JavaScript, in which you compile, interpret, and can run JavaScript code in different environments, allows you to repeat the process in other languages like Ruby, Python. If you follow the same example, you will be having the same situation. You can have Python code running with WebAssembly in many different environments in which before you couldn't do that. With this specific example that I'm going to show you, you can even combine them together. So you can develop applications that take advantage of the different ecosystems. You can write some part of the application in Python, another part in JavaScript, go to the different libraries that you need, and then you run all of them together to create more complex applications. So for this example, yeah, I think you can see it. So, just to give you a brief introduction about WASM Worker Server, how it works is that it reads the files inside a specific folder, and based on the file name, it will create API endpoints directly that you can access uh, in your browser or, or any tool that you want. This is called file system routing, and it's something that another project like Eleventy, for example, uses. So it's a very common pattern that we found pretty interesting for, for this project. So here, in this case, we have JavaScript.js, Python.py and Rust.wasm. We have code. Uh, we have different source code. Actually, the Wasm project, uh, the Wasm model is is based on Rust. So all of them will will run inside the same application together uh, using Wasm Worker Server. So just to give you a brief uh, vision about what's inside uh, the specific uh, files, this is the source code of the JS file. It's just a reply function that basically checks the method, that, that in this case, just if, if it supports or not. It creates a basic HTML code. It could be in a different file, but for now, we're just putting everything inside. And inside the code, we are just getting methods, some headers, the body that you pass to it, and then create a response, add some specific headers, and then return it. That's all that, that we need. If we see the Python code, in this specific case, it's something pretty similar. We just reproduce this in example, but in Python. For that, we created a new function called worker. Here we have pretty similar code in which we get the method, the host. We get all the information from the request. We create the response, put the header, and then return the response. But this could be a completely different application using a specific libraries, whatever you need for, for this specific endpoint. So this is the way you install uh, Wasm Worker Server. It has a single command I have already installed, so I'm not going to install it again. We see it's already there. So now I get into the app folder, run it directly, and it automatically picks all the different files written in completely different languages, and then expose them as an endpoint. So if we go here and open it, works okay so here we have the hello world directly and you can see that it's replying everything is running inside of WebAssembly it's totally sandbox it's using JavaScript oops the things that I see the close it's going to be difficult okay so now if I go here again I'm going for example the Python one same example and we are running everything together without having to deal with interpreters. You don't need to install anything. Get, get runs was a worker server, and then you get directly access to all this ecosystem and all this programming languages. Yeah, and 
that's all that I have to, to, to tell you today. Um, I think we have maybe one minute for questions. Okay. Yep. Okay, so the question is about, uh, in this talk we, we also show some Rust code. Yeah. So what's with the relationship between JavaScript and that part of the code? So the Rust code that we showed before is actually the Javi tooling. So this kind of the example that under the hood, many of these tools that interact with WebAssembly use Rust because of the compatibility that it has with the ecosystem. But that's only for, from the point of view of the tooling itself. Once you have that tool compiled, which is what developers finally download, you don't need to touch Rust if you don't want. Okay. So what you're saying is that once that's done, those those two you can compile to develop for the for the specific case, yeah, for the the specific case of Javi is basically running and converting JavaScript on WebAssembly. But for, for example, for the for the Wasm worker server, it works more or less under the same uh, under the hood is, is the same. So you get basically the the interpreters compile and then you put the code on top of that. For example, the Python interpreter is based on sync code, not in Rust. But you, but we compile already for you, so you don't need to do that compilation process, which is something that is not trivial for everyone. Even for me, I mean, it took me a while to set up the environment and the compilation. Basically, you can have um, different servers in different um, different languages, but then when they compile, they all communicate in JavaScript. So you can run it on the browser, or you could get you could then have your Rust API speak to your compiled app into JavaScript. Is that correct? So. Part, yeah, part is totally correct, and, it, and it's one of the biggest value proposition for WebAssembly. Once you compile a project to WebAssembly, that it could be using Java from JavaScript to WebAssembly, or using uh, Rust, C, or any of these languages, what you get finally is a WASM model, which is basically all the instruction compiled. Yeah. So those models can interact together, meaning that if you have those those properly those proper APIs defined between each other, you can invoke one specific function from a JavaScript source code calling a specific Python method in another model. So that's, that's part of what is under developer, which is uh, it's a proposal called the component model for WebAssembly, and it allows you to do exactly that. Interoperate between different languages all together in the, in the, uh, at the WebAssembly uh, level. And for the, the memory of the whole, uh, of when it's compiled, um, I'm understanding it's very, it's like, it doesn't take up too much memory. That's also, that's also another, another very interesting thing about WebAssembly. So one of the things that we did with Wasm is to compare how, for example, we have the Python interpreter, which is the one that it was used by Wasm Worker Server to run that Python code in the example, and it's only the Python interpreter compiled to WebAssembly. So it's about 18 megabytes, I think, because it includes the standard library. Of Python. If you compare that to the minimum or the minimal container that you can import for Python, it's almost double in size. So this is something interesting also about WebAssembly that you get right, you get only your source code compiling to WebAssembly, and that's your model. So it means that it reduces a lot of things when distributing models in faster and cheaper. Exactly. Faster than cloud. Exactly. It, it's true that faster. Depends in the case because, with, for example, what uh, what uh, Saul mentioned is that in a JavaScript, in a regular JavaScript uh, interpreter like V8 or Spider Monkey, there are a lot of optimizations that happen up during runtime. So all this did compiling and everything. So it depends on the specific case. More complete interpreters can perform optimization that can make the code run faster. But in theory, all the models that we get in assembly are smaller, so basically loading them is practically instant. Oh, thank you. It was a good talk. Thank you. Thank you.